Well, I had been working in the studio for most of that summer with uh, a vocalist named Randy Hall who had a record deal with uh, MCA at the time and he was the um, he was part of the group that Vince Willeburn and the Chicago guys had um, in the early 80s when Miles made his first comeback. And so um, I was involved with working with Randy and Randy said, oh, Miles uh, might be uh, coming out to LA to work on some tracks with us for the album, for his first Warner Brothers album, the album that became Tutu. And um, so I sort of knew that Miles was sort of lurking in the background there, but I, I, I was, you know, I figured I'd believe it when I see it. I mean, you know, I knew Randy knew him, but you just know how these things work out. One night the phone rings at my house, and it's Miles. And, you know, the characteristic rough voice, you know, hello. And uh, the first thing he said to me, he, he asked if, you know, if it was me, and he told me about the Randy had been telling him about me. And I think at that point, you have to also realize it's just at the point in time when the synthesizers are starting to sound really good. Things like the Prophet 5, the Oberheim, the samplers and things like that that are coming out um, really had full rich sounds. You could do a lot, you could program them. At this point you can really, uh, they weren't toys, you could really do uh, a lot of you know textural, orchestral kind of things. And he was interested, uh, he was a little bit interested in that I think from day one. And Randy told him about me that I'd been working with him um, on these different tracks and I think Miles was curious. and he. But what he did was he called me out of the blue, and I was completely nervous talking to him on the phone. And he told me, he goes, Adam, I gave Burke Backrack your phone number. And uh, I guess they both lived in the same uh, uh, neighborhood in Malibu. And uh, I, I was a little bit, that was a little bit of a curveball. I, I thanked him, you know, <laughs> for, for passing my name along. And, uh, and, uh, and, he, and, I, and I was kind of in a hurry to get off the phone because I was so nervous talking to him. And, I, and, and, and he said, where are you going? I got a session I want to do. I said, oh, okay, great. That's, that's, that's great. And so I, I, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, wow, it's true, you know? I managed to get off the phone in one piece, and I, I pretty much flipped out. Nine o'clock the next morning, the phone rings again. It's Miles again. Did Bert call you yet? And <laughs> I said, uh, no, he, Bert Backrat had not called. And I said, Miles, I'd rather play with you than Burt Bacharach. And he said, that's right. <laughs> so I guess I passed the first test. Um, and, at that, and then I, did a, I, I ended up going in the studio and doing some, uh, we, we did some tracks. And at the, at, at the end of the day, he, he wanted me to go to Europe with his band, which was leaving in three days. So it was almost so like a... Back a what was that like? Going into it, the studio, it, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> going into the studio for the first time with um, Well. These recording sessions were more like overdub and tracking sessions. So it wasn't like I was playing initially with the live band the first time. That would have been, of course, of course, amazing. But um, it was about putting the tracks together. And I was still very, very nervous. And Mike Stern was there, and he was also a big hero of mine. And, and, and uh, some of the other guys that Randy was working with, Zane Giles. And um, so, I mean, just the fact that I was part of that whole thing really was very exciting to me and I think I, I did play a little bit on the session and so I was thrilled just to have been part of of a mile session and he was pretty encouraging I mean I think he really liked the sounds and he, and he liked it was a new way of working for him at that point he'd most he'd done most of his sessions tracking live in the studio even in the um, later uh, Columbia projects and this was at the point now where people were like stopping uh, and, and doing just a drum machine and, and overdubbing track by track and not to say that that's you know a, a great method of uh, creating music but it was something that was really new to him and really interesting to him and he really liked the idea that you could um, do uh, do things piece by piece very meticulously. And who was he listening to? At the time, he was really intrigued. This was, I think, the beginning of the real Prince era, and he was really intrigued with, um, with, and all the, also even the Quincy product, productions and things like that. The, the really sophisticated R and B stuff was was really um, something he was interested in. And, and one of the things he kept telling me the whole time I was in the band was listen to the little parts, two bar phrases, four bar phrases, these horn riffs from James Brown, guitar riffs uh, from Prince, clavinet licks from. Uh, Parliament, all these little elements, he would like to try to put the whole thing together to make up sort of a big clock. And that was the way records were being made, and it was a bunch of little parts being put together. And he always liked 
he was always interested in secondary parts and in orchestration, and he'd always point out something in the background, even on a Gil Evans track or something like that, you know, instruments that give the sound more of a color than just the top line and the, and the bass note. One of the things that, that his musicians always say is that, that uh, he knew exactly how to talk to you. Is that true of you? Well, I think so. I mean, he, he talked in standard musician talk a lot of the times. I mean, there's this mystique that, that he would use uh, talking these, you know, uh, indecipherable codes or things like that. And very often he talks specifically about keys, uh, rhythmic values, triplets, uh, superimposing triads, I mean, very specifically. So, I mean, in, in that regard, of course, I mean, he was, you know, he, being the ultimate musician, he's, he uh, knew how to communicate his ideas to his musicians. Right. Um, who, was the, uh, who was the funniest thing ever? Because people don't realize what a <laughs> funny motherfucker he was. He was very funny, and, and of course, I won't be able to remember. Well, I do have one funny story. I, I can. It's, it's not a real knee slapper, but um, I, we spent a lot of time in airports, and also we would always be working on little demos and tracks at home, and we we play miles, you know, things we were, ideas we're working on, and he was always interested in 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 in. Uh, in things the guys in the band was, were working on and m maybe is looking to ideas he could incorporate, et cetera. And uh, so one time I, uh, I was, we were standing around in an airport and I had a track I wanted to play for him. I had, I had my headphones, my Sony Walkman, and I said, I got the song I want to play for you, Miles. And he says, do you have a piece of gum? And uh, I don't remember if I had a piece of gum or not, but uh, I ended up, he ended up not listening to the song. Three weeks later, we're home from the tour. Uh, early in the morning, phone rings. All right, motherfucker, play me your song. <laughs> and uh, I played it for him over the phone, and he liked it actually. But um, you know, so he, uh, you know, he would definitely. He had a pretty, you know, yeah. He was thinking all the time, and he was sort of, you know, fucking with people in a good way sometimes. You know, never fuck with them in a bad way that you saw. Um, well, I mean, he'd be sorry. He could be hard on people and it sometimes would be imbalanced. Like, if you were new in the band, you could almost do no wrong because he was intrigued with the newness, the new sound, the new element. And, and I found that, that the longer I was there, the better I was playing, the more I learned the music, the sometimes the harder he was on me. And, um, which is great because it, you know, it was incredible, you know, baptism by fire kind of experience. I mean, you, you don't get that. And I know I grew as a musician um, in that band, of course, more than in any other situation. But you know, there some you know, a compliment would would um, would put you floating on air for three weeks, and a and um, and a uh, a serious criticism could could leave you down in the dumps and, and really rethinking <laughs> your whole uh, approach sometimes, you know. So, I mean, he definitely had that power over people, especially if you were working with him closely, you know. I, I, I think that he was meaner to people he didn't know at all, like to a waiter in a restaurant or, so, or, or someone at a ticket counter or something like that. I mean, I think he would be, you know, uh, the, the, the real withering stuff would come out more with strangers than with uh, guys he worked with closely. Pleasure talking to you, Adam. Thank you so much.